In this module, we are going to talk about child poverty. First, we will talk about why child poverty is important and what are some of the myths surrounding children in poverty. Second, we will see how to measure monetary child poverty and talk about intra-household allocation and equivalence scales. Then we will touch upon gender differences. And finally, we will talk about some of the policies to reduce child poverty. Let's talk about why child poverty is important. First, because children make up one quarter of the world population. And even if child population is slowly decreasing due to lowering fertility rates, it is still a large share of the total. In sub-Saharan Africa, children under 14 are over 40% of the population. Projections tell us that by 2050, about 40% of the world's total child population will live in Africa. Right now, about 50% of the African population is under 18 years of age. However, poverty is projected to remain high in Africa. Despite poverty having decreased, the largest share of poor people will still be in the African continent, which means that a lot of children will still be living in poverty in the future. Second, child poverty is persistent. Here we see an example from Tanzania. We see both monetary poverty and deprivation, which will be discussed in the next module. But let's focus on monetary metrics. Consumption in one year predicts consumption four years later for children and children who were poor in 2008-2009 are 21 percentage points more likely to be poor four years later, even when controlling for a lot of factors such as household composition, education of the parents, etc. Third, children are particularly vulnerable to poverty. They do not typically control resources within the household, but depend on adults for material resources, food, shelter, care, and so on. This is true especially for young children. In general, children have little agency and opportunity at the social level. They do not vote and are not normally included in policy decisions, even when they have hard consequences from them. For example, the austerity policies following the 2009-10 crisis in Europe had devastating consequences on children. And the policies taken now in 2020 to manage the COVID-19 pandemic are having severe impacts on children's lives. Children are also more vulnerable to shocks, such as a loss of a parent, income shocks, etc. Shocks are more likely to trigger negative coping strategies in poor households, such as child labor, child marriage, and food insecurity. Finally, increase in economic stress is demonstrated to increase violence against children and women. As an example, here we see the simulated impact of the global economic crisis on three West African countries and how child poverty rates increased with the crisis, while they would have decreased in a non-crisis scenario. We can expect the COVID-19 pandemic to have similar effects if strong policies to support these most vulnerable people are not put in place. Fourth, child poverty has long-lasting consequences, which have been long studied. Children in poor households are less healthy and less nourished, have less education, and they have higher mortality rates. This has long-lasting consequences. Lower education and poor nutritional status impact future employment opportunities, which can lead to poverty traps. The stress of chronic poverty can have long-lasting physical and mental consequences. We know from longitudinal studies that children who grew up in poverty have lower incomes and poorer health as adults. Here we see an example, again from Tanzania. Children who were in poverty in 2008-2009 are still more likely to be behind in school, of two or more grades, in 2012-2013, four years later, even if we control for poverty status in 2012-2013. We see that the effects of poverty are persistent. Even if we know all this, some myths around poverty keep persisting. You may have heard that children are poor because parents make poor reproductive choices, or because they do not follow a certain path such as education, then employment, then marriage, and only then have children. 
You may also have heard that social assistance is not good because it has negative effects on poor people. It encourages dependency and disincentivizes work. People spend money on alcohol and drugs. Child grants will increase fertility and that ultimately it's unsustainable and unaffordable for national budgets. All these ideas reflect the notion that poverty is a matter of character and personal responsibility rather than of structural problems, and that to fix poverty we have to somehow fix the poor. A lot of recent empirical research debunks these myths, both in low- and high-income countries. We know, for example, the most poverty can be reduced by adequate social policies, which do not encourage bad behavior nor increase fertility. Effects on employment are ambiguous, and what decreases is often casual, unstable work. People fall into poverty for a wide variety of reasons. In many high-income countries, it is expensive to be poor, which feeds the cycle of poverty. Policies should aim at removing barriers to quality social services such as education and health and providing support for families, including financial support when needed. Living in poverty is also associated with stigma, which has negative impacts on children's lives. People in poverty may avoid accessing available aid because of this, and many children living in poverty report feelings of shame, frustration, and humiliation. All these negative sentiments are associated with depression, low life satisfaction, and marginalization that reinforce the cycle of poverty. Policies should aim to try to break this cycle. Now that we know why child poverty matters, let's see how we measure it. Monetary child poverty is measured using monetary aggregates, usually income or expenditure at the household level. If the aggregate falls below a certain poverty line, then the household is poor. All the people in a poor household are classified as poor. Monetary poverty is measured usually in absolute or relative terms and at national or international levels. Relative poverty is often used in high-income countries, for example in the European Union, and it depends on the distribution of income in a country. In other words, how poor you are is considered in relation to the wealth of everyone in the country. It is comparing your stand in relation to others in the country. If the distribution changes, so does the poverty line. In times of economic recession, relative poverty can appear to be decreasing because of the overall contraction of income. Absolute poverty lines are derived by a calories equivalent and or a basket of basic goods evaluated at national prices. The international poverty line for extreme poverty is $1.90 a day in purchasing power parity. In general, in low-income countries, expenditure and consumption data is used because income data is less reliable due to large numbers engaged in the informal sector with poor registration of income, the consumption of goods oneself has produced, etc. But some high-income countries rely on expenditure data and absolute poverty lines as well, for example, the U.S. and Italy. What goes into the basket defines poverty. If children's items and foods do not go into the basket, child poverty may be underestimated. The cost of child services, such as child care, is a relevant expenditure for families. National poverty lines can be tricky. Sometimes they do not increase with the increase in national income, remaining artificially low. And for many low-income countries, they tend to be lower than the international line. This leads to underestimations of poverty. National poverty lines are partially the result of a political process, especially if the statistical office is not clearly independent from the government. However, national poverty lines are used by governments as a tool for policies, and they have a central role in national advocacy and debate. For example, in the United States, the official national poverty line plays a central role in government policy. It is the basis for determining the eligibility for many federal and state government programs. In the EU, the poverty threshold is calculated at 60% of the median income. 
It's usually considered more as a measure of at-risk of poverty and especially social exclusion. In the EU, children who lived in households below this threshold range from 35.8% in Romania to 11.7% in Slovenia in 2019. The average is 22.5%, which means that one in four children in Europe is at risk of poverty and social exclusion. It is important to understand that child poverty is a widespread phenomenon and found in high-income countries as well. In the UK, following years of steady decline in child poverty rates, child absolute poverty has been increasing in recent years, as well as in the US. In OECD countries, 21% of all children live in relative income poverty, and in many countries, there has been an increase in child poverty since 2008. Children are more likely to be poor with any poverty line we use, and young children even more so. At the global level, using the $1.90 poverty line, 9.2% of adults were poor in 2013, while 19.5% of children and 21% of children younger than 10 were poor. In 2017, the poverty rate was 8% for adults and 17.5% for children. Additionally, 841 million children live in poverty if we consider the slightly higher poverty line of $3.20, and 1.35 billion children live with less than $5.50 a day. Poverty rates tend to decrease with age, with young children being the ones with the highest poverty rates. They become lower for the working age population until old age. Here we see an example of poverty calculated with the national poverty line of Tanzania, a low-income country, using both the basic needs poverty line and the basic calories poverty line, the food poor columns. With any definition, in both in rural and urban areas, children have higher poverty rates than adults. The same is true if we look at the poverty rates of Armenia a middle, low-income country in a completely different context. Still, children have higher poverty rates than adults. What about subnational levels? In this example from Mozambique, we see that in all provinces, from the poorest to the less poor, children are at a higher risk of poverty. Poverty is calculated at the household level. However, resources are not necessarily distributed equally within the family. Monetary measures of child poverty assume, by construction, that resources are equally distributed within the household. However, how they are distributed in practice depends on various factors, including the balance of power within the household. Economic theory has long been studying these issues, and several models have been proposed and employed. Essentially, there are two models of the household. The first assumes someone makes all the decisions, which can be either the household as a whole entity or a benevolent dictator, usually identified with the male head of the household. The second model acknowledges that in the household there are different individuals with different preferences who bargain over the decisions to be made. It is important to know that in these models, children are never an active part of the decision process. In all models, parents are altruistic towards children, which means that they consider children's well-being in their decisions. Bargaining models are based on two main assumptions, that parents have different preferences about allocation of resources and that there is an exit option, typically divorce. Bargaining power depends on the exit option. So if women have exit options, autonomy, own income, etc., it means they have more power which in turn means they can allocate resources according to their preferences. There is some evidence that women's empowerment has a positive effect on a range of children's outcomes, such as nutrition or schooling. However, it is not clear that this stems from different preferences than those of men. There is some evidence that the gender of the recipient of social assistance matters for the outcomes. However, Often these studies do not and cannot compare directly men versus women because the transfer is made to either one person or the other. 
For example, many children grants are allocated to women, but there is not an additional treatment that allocates them to men, so we lack the counterfactual. Additionally, the design of social assistance can reinforce stereotypical gender roles placing an extra burden on women. For example, that was the case of many conditional cash transfers in Latin America, which have been criticized for this reason. There is also evidence that parents allocate resources differently among children, for example, to compensate for shocks or to invest in the child with the highest perceived ability. Equivalence scales are a tool used when analyzing data to assign household income or consumption between members under the assumption that there are some economies of scale. Economies of scale are important because some goods are shared by all family members. For example, a family of four does not need four TVs, and the assumption that children consume only a fraction of one adult. Equivalent scales usually produce adult equivalents, which is a standardized unit of the number of household members. There are many types of equivalent scales. The general formula for adult equivalents is this. The number of adult equivalents, AE, is equal to the number of adults, N underscore A, plus alpha, times the number of children, n underscore c, elevated to theta. Alpha and theta are parameters that range between 0 and 1. Alpha measures children's contribution. If it's equal to 1, then they count as much as adults. If it's 0, they are not considered at all. Theta measures the economies of scale, and the lower the theta is, the more economies of scale in the family. If theta is 1 and alpha is 0 0.5, a family of two adults and two children is equal to three adult equivalents. If theta is 0 0.7, the same family is equal to 2.16 adult equivalents. The OECD uses an equivalence scale that considers each 0 0.5 as an additional adult beside the head of household and 0 0.3 as each child. Recently, however, they have started using the square root of the household size. You can see how the choice of the equivalent scale can influence the poverty rate because it changes the resulting per capita value of consumption slash income. In this example, our family of four has a household income of 2000 a month. The poverty line is evaluated at $800 per capita per month. Depending on the number of adult equivalents, the household members are, or are not, poor. However, they still have the same income. This would determine their ability to access social assistance. Because there are more children in poor households, the choice of the discount factor for children, alpha, is relevant. Children are also more likely to be found in larger households, so the choice of the economies of scale is also important. A small alpha and theta can result in severe underestimation of child poverty. Equivalence scales can also vary between countries or over time. It is important to conduct a sensitivity analysis when using equivalence scales. However, remember that most low-income countries use a per capita measure without equivalence scales. Global poverty rates change when applying equivalence scales. However, child poverty changes less than adult poverty. Using equivalent scales versus per capita will generally show lower poverty rates for children. An implication of household collective models is that there needs to be a rule on how to share resources. This rule can be empirically estimated using exclusive consumption items and allocation of labor supply. Using this framework, Mangiavacci and Piccoli, in their work of 2010, find that poor households devote proportionally less resources to children, implying that children may be even poorer. They also find that the poverty headcount, using the sharing rule, is higher. We will now talk briefly about gender differences in poverty. It is hard to identify differences between girls and boys as poverty is measured at the household level. Do women and or girls live in poorer households? There is some evidence of this, which can be the result of several economic and social processes. 
It is important to remember that female-headed households and male-headed households cannot be compared directly to measure gender differences since they are two different types of households. While they are generally poorer than other households in part due to larger gender differences in society, female-headed households are usually the result of widowhood and out-migration and are generally single adult households, while male-headed households are the norm, which also means they have more adults, so they should be compared with caution. A recent study revealed that women and girls, compared to men and boys, are more likely to be poor at most ages, including a young age. This difference is most prevalent in Central and South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. At a global level, the biggest gap is observed between 25 and 34-year-olds. Finally, we review some of the policies that can reduce monetary child poverty. Because monetary child poverty reflects general household poverty, policies that lower this will also affect child poverty. However, we have seen that households with children are more likely to be poor, so, to reduce child poverty, it is crucial to focus on households with children. There are two types of interventions. Policy changes on earned income, which are a tool mostly used in high-income countries, such as a tax credit or deductions and detractions based on the number of children in a family. They are applied to income earned by adults. However, they exclude people who are outside of the formal labor market. The other type of intervention is social protection and social assistance programs providing help such as cash transfers, child grants, pensions, and social insurance. Cash transfers and child grants are mostly used in middle and low-income countries, but they are increasingly used everywhere. In early 2021, the U.S. approved a massive expansion of their tax credit scheme, which effectively introduces a child allowance. The expected results are a dramatic decrease in child poverty. Other studies from the U.S. confirm that cash transfers have a positive effect on child poverty and children's outcomes in nutrition, education, etc. The expansion of unconditional cash transfer programs in sub-Saharan Africa has resulted in reduced child poverty and an improved outcome for children across the board. In this slide, we see some examples of impacts derived by rigorous impact evaluations. As we can observe, on average, the effects are positive, improving household income and reducing poverty. Other policies aimed at increasing the access of impoverished children and their families to high-quality social services, such as education, health, and nutrition, can indirectly contribute to lowering child poverty. For example, relaxing the income constraint of households with children by such methods as free or subsidized childcare and schooling, lowering the costs of children's services such as free school materials, health care, etc. Policies on parental leave and minimum wage can also positively affect child poverty, helping to stabilize household incomes. Ensuring an adequate proportion of the national budget is devoted to children and families is also part of the process of ensuring child poverty is reduced. Finally, what not to do is try to fix the poor. We know that poverty is not a behavioral problem, and trying to change people's behavior in order to reduce poverty is not only ineffective, but also ethically questionable.